dazzled by the fact that he had all this, what he considered to be really good cover on his property. And he's owned this for a very long time. And, and since the day that he originally purchased it, he remembers deer utilizing these cedar stands extensively for bedding and cover. And, but what's happened over time, as these cedars have gradually matured, as you can see, they have closed canopy together, grown extremely dense ceiling of, of green shade here, or covered, creating a lot of dense shade in, in the understory. Then what happens is these lower branches that get restricted from sunlight start to die off. And not only do you have a barren landscape in here of absolutely zero growing, especially at this time of year, there's no vegetation left. He said in the summertime there is some uh, knee-high uh, plants that do tend to, to survive in the shade. Very few though. But then you have all these dead, dry, stiff branches that are very uncomfortable even for a person to thread through here. And one of the telltale tell -tell, um, little experiments that he, he and his son Kale did were came in here and created some hallways with chainsaws and, and cut back some of these limbs and the deer immediately gravitated to using those routes that they cut in here. When we showed up a couple days ago, we, we dropped in here and the, the sign was really confined to these travel routes and very little of any sign off of them. Up here at, underneath these cedars, which you would think a deer would want to utilize for bedding for thermal cover. No needles, of course, cedars don't really have needles. No green on any of these lower branches. It's all at the top. The wind's blowing through here, so it doesn't do very good at all for thermal cover from, from wind protection. And they had an extremely cold winter here with deep snow and, and zero temperatures for two weeks, below zero temperatures for two weeks straight. So what we've assessed and told Craig is that these cedars have just outgrown their, their, their productivity. And he said originally in 1969, there were photos of this farm and there were none of these cedars on here. So we're talking 50 some years old of growth of, the, of these trees. The strategy for him and then what we're recommendation is going to be, by the way, we, we went from that project nine field to the entire property and, and looking at what we're gonna actually do here with a full blown consultation with Craig and looking at all the different aspects of the habitat on this property and trying to improve that to bring the deer back in here in general, but also to be able to hold more mature bucks. What our proposal will be for Craig is to eliminate, luckily there's a service here nearby that they harvest these large trees for cedar shavings. So we can have a logging company come in here with a feller, bunch fellers and physically or mechanically remove these trees, cut them off, take them out of the clearing, strip the br branches off of them and cut them into eight foot sections and, and drive off and he gets a check for that. So not only will that save him a tremendous amount of labor and, and months and months, if not years of, of, of laborious work, but it'll also put a check in his pocket that he can invest back in into the property. But what we're hoping to be able to do is leave some of the youngest, smaller diameter cedars and, and some of the hardwoods that did generate in here before it got closed off and leave those hardwood trees in here. And then that's gonna take us to the next level. What comes up after the cedars are gone? You, you will not eliminate the cedars forever in here because just, we are, it's this the habitat, it's here. The cedars are a very natural and normal, um, a common plant here. And I know a lot of folks are 100% dead against cedars at all. And some guys like them sparingly, but it, here in Eastern Nebraska in these draws, this is what grows. There's, there's just no way around it. So we're gonna work with what we've got to work with, but also manage it intensively so that he can have the best result. I mean, look at the diameter of that tree. That tree is probably one that we're talking about that's 50 plus years old. A little pocket of sunlight coming in right here. There's a couple small deciduous trees here, hardwoods. We found that the majority of what we've seen here is hard, in hardwoods is mulberry. So here's an unusual spot. And again, it's where they've chainsaw, chainsaw cut these branches back and created an opening. But what we're talking about is looking at targeting and leaving a young cedar that's three to four inches or, or so in diameter, a young, younger age class, there's one here that's young, but taking out this tree and that tree and that tree and that tree and that tree and giving some big open spaces so that he can still retain some structure in here, still have some shade from some of the remaining cedars in these hardwoods, 
but creating these huge pools and pockets of open, uh, open space with sunlight reaching the, uh, the forest floor in here for regeneration. So it will still technically be considered a cedar hillside, but with these glades of warm season grasses and, and the natural weeds and forbs and, and wildflowers even that are, are, that are found here in these native soils. So we've got some bigger open areas that he's actually done some extreme clearing with heavy equipment and has removed a bunch of cedars. So he's going to have some really cool diversity here between the natural cedar stands with intense management and some open field areas that are going to be planted back to full spectrum warm season grasses. Looking at the aerial perspective of that big draw that had all the native cedars growing in it on Craig's farm in Nebraska, this was the corner where we originally started walking down this draw looking both directions and on these what you don't see here is the rolling contours of hills inside this. This is where we immediately recognized that all of these trees were way past their useful size and age class, dead underneath, just desolate, um, no vegetation under them, all the tops, or excuse me, all the growth on the cedars was way at the tops. And I told him immediately that he needed to do some very major harvesting of timber, removing most of that to start creating some distance between those. If he wanted to keep cedars in there, leave some remaining pockets of the ones that appear to be younger, removing the giant ones that are skeletons and and starting over again. So that's the plan for this. Uh, all these larger big blocks of cedars are going to be harvested and thinned dramatically uh, over the course of this year and into next. And you can see where the, the aerial photo shows area that he did has already has completed some major thinning on. He did leave some scattered trees that are probably going to end up coming out too, but these light tan piles or, or circles are actually piles of dead cedars that will be burned. And that's really the all that was recommended for him was just to do a major thinning and resetting of the age class of the cedars because there's nothing else, I shouldn't say there's nothing else, but this grows. This is the native seed. This is the native uh, the vegetative type that comes up for cover so you really can't fight it there you just have to deal with it and manage it accordingly to keep it utilized by the deer uh, it, it became apparent to him after we talked about it but it was such a gradual process over 15 20 years of him owning this property it, you know just it just grew so slowly that one day he looked and thought why aren't the deer here like they used to be why why aren't i holding mature bucks like i used to be um, for us, it was easy to go in there and see, but it, for him, it was a gradual thing. So um, that's it for the cedars, really just a, uh, an aggressive strategy of harvesting timber to reset the age class and, and, and that accompanied with some herbicide treatments and things that we're going to talk about later will uh, help him achieve his goals here for that.